web event. Perfect. All right. And so that being said, uh, it is three o'clock. I'll leave the poll question up a little bit longer and we'll get started in, mm, I'll say about 20 seconds. And for our uh, presenters, for Anthony and Carol, it looks like individuals completing the poll uh, in regards to their current knowledge, it looks like people are identifying between minimal and moderate as far as how they would rank their current knowledge on this topic. I'm going to give people just a few more seconds before we end the poll question and begin. Thank you all who are joining, who are completing the poll question. Looks like more people are logging in. Again, thank you all for joining. Please note that we do have a poll question up. We have a file uh, available for you to access. And then we also have our close, live closed captioning occurring as well for individuals. Okay. All right. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and close out the poll and uh, it will close in about 15 seconds. And we will start today's web event. All right, about five more seconds. All right, great. Let's go ahead and begin. All right, again, uh, welcome to everyone, uh, and thank you all for joining today's web event, Wellness Program Implementation Series Part 3, Components of a Wellness Program, Embedded Mental Health Provider. My name is William Moore with OJJDP's INTAC, and this webinar is brought to you by our colleagues at the Innocent Justice Foundation. Please note that we are recording today's web event. The web webinar, including other archived webinars, will be available on INTAC's YouTube page. You can go there to view additional webinars on juvenile justice and child victimization prevention. If you would like to get access to any supporting materials, you may do so by contacting the OJJDP TTA help desk at OJJDP TTA at USDOJ.gov. <coughs> the webinar will also be archived on OJJDP's multimedia page as well. If you're having any trouble downloading the file transfer uh, or the files that I provide in the file transfer application, please uh, feel free to message me, the host, and I can help you to get access to that document. We will also put a link to the document on a Google Drive if you're running to any issues or troubles getting access to uh, that document that I've provided. For optimal audio, we are asking for you all to have the WebEx system dial your phone line when you're connected. It will show a uh, phone or a headset icon to indicate that you are indeed connected to the audio. If you're sp experiencing any technical issues, please uh, feel free to contact uh, me through a private message. During today's web event, we will be taking questions and we ask that participants please submit their questions in the chat box. When you're submitting your questions related to the content, please make sure you select either everyone or to all, excuse me, um, you want to select everyone or you want to select to all panelists when you're sending your question related to today's webinar. Again, select everyone or all panelists when you're sending your question in, and then you would hit enter or you would select the send button. Now, please help us count. If you're viewing by yourself or alone, there's no need to type anything at this time. However, if you're viewing in the group, it, meaning there's more than one individual with you, not including yourself, please type in the total number of additional people that are in the room with you today to help us count. Please send it to all panelists or send to everyone. If you're viewing by yourself or alone, there's no need to type anything at this time. And again, only the number of additional people in the room with you today. 
Please note that you all will receive a certificate of attendance within 24 hours via an automated email from OJJDP's Intac uh, with the certificate of attendance attached. Please keep an eye on your email for your certificate. Here's an agenda of today's uh, webinar and what we will discuss. And that being said, I will now turn over today's web event to Gabby to do our welcome and to start our web event. Gabby, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ellen. I'm just going to quickly close my window here. It seems to be hurricaning outside in San Diego. So that's so what you see me blowing in the wind over here. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as William said, this is part three of our series on the wellness implementation. Um, we address kind of the uh, broad aspects of how to start a program and what the different components of a program might be, as well as how you can assess your team and decide which program might be best for you in the past two webinars of the series. So if you missed those, uh, go ahead and watch them on the NTEX YouTube channel, or you can also go to shiftwellness.org. Uh, we have them recorded there as well. Um, and so today we will focus more on wellness implementation with a mental health provider. Um, and that's why we have our wonderful Carol Brusca and Anthony Mace with us. For those of you who are listening to me for the first time, I'm just going to quickly introduce myself. Um, I am the program manager for uh, the Davis and Justice Foundation um, and the Shift Wellness Program. And we are a technical training assistance provider for all 61 ICAC Internet Crimes Against Children units across the country and their affiliates. So, in normal times, uh, we do wellness trainings and we do them in person on a full day basis and we try to mitigate the traumatic, um, the trauma and, and stress that people that are in this profession are dealing with due to the nature of the material that they need to watch on a daily basis. Um, COVID has kind of allowed us to broaden our, our scope and be able to reach out to more people and create a different series. And so this is how wellness implementation came to be, and we are so happy to be able to provide this to you guys. Um, we will also have a separate uh, part of this that will focus on chaplaincy and on peer support, and then we will conclude with kind of assessing your program and what you can do to move ahead. Um, this is just a disclaimer that we are funded through OGDP, and this series was created for ICAC Task Force units. But again, we uh, this is basically information that is applicable across the board. So no matter what agency you're a part of, uh, if you're an affiliate, if you're an ICAC team member, this uh, could be very, very useful to you. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to one of our trainers. As I mentioned, uh, we have Anthony Mace, who is the ICAC commander in New Mexico. And we have Carol Brusco, who is his embedded mental health provider. So we thought they would be the absolute best and most perfect team to give you this information. Um, I will be in the chat, so if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know, and I'll keep an eye on that. And thank you so much for those of you who have submitted questions uh, during registration. We will get to those at the very end if we have responded to them uh, during the PowerPoint, um, and we can address them then. So thank you again, and Anthony, take it away. You are muted, Anthony. So being muted was on purpose because I'm sure <laughs> I was going to do yes. hoping people could read my lips. <laughs> um, thank you for the wonderful introduction. So you didn't get a chance to hear that nice uh, part. Um, so again, we're excited to be with you. Um, it's we've actually got really used to the virtual environment, so it's actually very enjoyable to do it this way as well. Um, but we'd also like to be with you in person and hopefully. Um, soon, um, we'll get a chance to actually uh, be with you in person and do some of these trainings. Um, again, my name is Anthony Mays. I'm the uh, uh, commander and the special agent in charge with the Office of the New Mexico Attorney General. Um, I've been in law enforcement for over over 32 years, not that I'm counting, but I'm actually going on 33. Um, I actually uh, was with the Albuquerque Police Department. It, um, for about 20 years, and I, I finished there in violent crimes. And the reason I'm sharing this with you because a lot of what we'll be talking about um, is things that I actually experienced as a patrol officer, as a detective, as a supervisor, and now as a commander of a task force, where I started to see um, just everyday law enforcement work took a toll on my troops, 
Um, I saw a lot of vicarious trauma, compassion, fatigue among among my troops um, when I was with the Albuquerque police um, working in violent crimes. Uh, saw a lot of that taking place, and we saw the effects of that alcoholism, uh, domestic. Uh, a lot of issues with the individual to physical health and things like that and how it's not affected them. So um, what I learned through that is that um, I needed to do something different as a commander when I started developing the ICAC task force because I didn't want to see that again. I didn't want to see where my folks were um, experiencing many of those things and then it was they weren't in, they weren't able to finish the marathon of, of law enforcement, which is why I think I've been doing this for so long, um, because I've been able to take care of myself and look out for the things that I need to do. So I implemented a wellness program um, within our state um, and um, I made some mistakes along the way when I started implementing it. Uh, probably the biggest mistake I made is finding the right person. I was able to find Carol Bruska. Um, she was one of my colleagues at the university. Uh, she was overseeing another program, and I, I thought she's a good fit for my team. So um, brought Carol on board, which I'm excited. I get a chance to teach with her here as well. And uh, we're able to implement an amazing wellness program for our state. Um, so today we'll be sharing that with you, the many successes that we've had. And then, of course, some of the obstacles we've had as well, and some of the things you can do to implement a program in your state. So uh, welcome, and uh, we'll just go ahead and dive in. Well, actually, let me introduce uh, Carol, because I don't want to forget about her, <laughs> the most important part. <laughs> um, so there we go, Carol. Hi, I'm Carol Bruska. I am the embedded MHP for Anthony's ICAC, actually our ICAC task force here in New Mexico under the Attorney General's office. Um, Anthony and I have been working together for a very long time. We train together, we work together, um, with the task force, um, and we have been able to recognize what's worked and what hasn't worked, and so we thought that this would be an opportunity for us to help facilitate a conversation around how to make a program that will work for you without having to recreate the wheel in, in many ways that we did. Um, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and my, um, my passion is wellness and resilience and helping people to get over any kind of trauma that they're experiencing because I want people to have a life that they enjoy that feels like they're achieving their goals and and whatever I can do to make that happen is what I would like to do. So I'm here today to work with Anthony. We're going to talk about programs and how you can um, find the MHP for a program and what that would look like and hopefully you'll be able to take something away from that. Um, I do believe that you could put questions in the chat. I believe also that there were some questions that people asked beforehand. So hopefully if the questions that you asked beforehand are not addressed, we can address them at the end. Um, we're really excited about what we do. We know that our particular program will not fit. It's not a cookie cutter model, um, but if you can take bits and pieces of it to implement for your own program, or if you need more assistance in creating a program, Anthony and I are available for both of those um, options as well. So, Anthony, let's go ahead and get started. Right. So, our, our objectives today are to understand why wellness programs are vital for ICAC teams, and we're going to talk in depth about this. Um, we're going to identify how to assess the team needs. We're going to talk about the types of programs and explore the implementation and challenges um, and discuss assessing ongoing satisfaction. So we started some of these things. We've been touching on these things throughout the series and we will continue to touch on those. But today we're going to really dive deep and talk about the wellness program and what um, what it would look like for you. Thank you, Carol. So let's start off by smashing the stigma. And I, I think this is, a, um, we all think this is important. So. We developed a wellness program uh, years ago. Uh, commanders um, who all retired except for me, it seems like. <laughs> um, but uh, we started the, we started this wellness program with the shift uh, with shift, of course, uh, years ago because we identified that uh, law enforcement sometimes will be the last rest for help because we're out to help everyone and and we wear many different hats, but one of those hats is not necessarily taking care of ourselves. So. Um, as we go through this and, 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 and then moving forward, I want you to think about that, that there is no stigma to asking for help. 
and there is no stigma to to say, you know what, um, we need to do something different here, because for the longest time we have all done that. I mean, I again, being a cop as long as I have, and um, many of you probably have, been, have the number of years that I have on, where um, you remember choir practice. And that was a way that we didn't want to talk about what we, we were dealing with at the time that we went and had drinks after work, you know, so it went from that to from work to drinking to talking about the job and that's the way we dealt with it. So we're moving away from that more and we're actually recognizing that we need to have something in place to take care of ourselves so we can accomplish what our goal is, is to help people. So there is no stigma. What we will be talking about today, and I, I realize this is really geared towards it's ICAC, but this works for everyone. As I mentioned before, um, I worked in, in violent crime. So if you're in sex crimes, homicide, robbery, um, domestic violence, you're dealing with people, okay? And what you experience every day when you deal with people um, is, is going to take an effect on you, okay, without a doubt. You know, so I want you to remember that. I'll never forget one of my investigators um, when I was at APD. I walked into his office after he had done an interview with a sex crimes detect uh, victim, and he was sitting there crying. And I look at him. I go, "You okay?" And he goes, "Well, he goes, well, she went through so much." And this is a this is a big bad guy. You know, I never expected that. And his door was closed, and I went to check on him, and he was crying. And I said, "Are you? You know, I, I, I what do you want to talk about it?" I wasn't sure how to talk about it because I didn't have that formal training or anything, but I wanted to let him know that I was there for him. So let's keep that in mind as we go through this program and as we start to, to develop our own programs within our states that we need to look out for each other. And again, there's no stigma. So the importance of support, um, as I mentioned, the wellness programs provide an added support to to our, our troops and then to our a course for ourselves. Um, and having a successful program can definitely increase um, an ICAC team morale and the effectiveness, effectiveness of the team. Um, of course, you know, as you all know, being an ICAC investigator, an examiner, forensic interviewer, um, whatever your role is on the ICAC team or working um, crimes against people, um, you'll know it does take a toll on you. Um, and we have a lot of in, a lot of time invested in that. It, we, we can't become an ICAC investigator overnight. So having a successful program helps us keep those folks in place, increases the morale, increases the effectiveness, and then decreases the burnout and turnover. Um, I'm, and I, I hate to say this as a manager that, you know, that, you know, we spend a lot of money and time on our folks, but it isn't just about that. It's about their well-being and they leave healthy and happy, right? That's what we're really concerned about. But also as a manager, um, we put a lot of time and money in our, in our folks too. And if they burn out quickly and we have to replace them, um, it's, we have to start over again. And, and it's an injustice to that individual who got burned out and they had to leave and, and definitely an injustice to our, our victims because they don't have the best person working for them right at that time. They will eventually, of course, you know, because we get them up to speed, but it's important that we look for that, that the burnout and turnover isn't there. And then of course it benefits the families and of, of that individual um, and, and the support system, because as we all know that many times we take things that happen at work home and sometimes our families are, are um, a brunt of what's actually going on. And, and uh, I, I remember doing that myself, you know, uh, years ago when I was, before I started a wellness program that I'd, I'd come home and I'd stay quiet and I want to be by myself because I had a rough day in homicide. And um, so we, we want to help our families. We want to help, help them. And then of course our support system, our friends and be there for them. So. Again, as we move forward to this, think about the importance and how it's going to help you and your families. So why build a wellness pro program? It really will help to improve the health of employees. We know the toll that stress takes on us as individuals. It doesn't just impact us from a, a mental health perspective, it can impact our physical health as well. And if we have employees that are feeling mentally well, 
It's going to increase their physical health, which is going to increase the likelihood that they're going to be ready, willing, and able to work and get the job done. It's going to reduce the overall cost of the employer. So if we think about the cost of um, training the employee and then the cost of having them gone for um, sick leave or having them not be at their highest ability to work due to the fact that they are stressed or not feeling well. All of those things are gonna cost us as employers and we don't, that's a cost we don't have to have. And on top of that, really improving the health of the employees is the right thing to do. It's, it's the right thing to do to make sure that we are taking care of our folks because the work that they're doing, regardless of whether you're working as a mental health director in a detention center or you're working um, in the, for an ICAC task force or you're working for the FBI, working for victim advocacy, wh whatever the case may be, it's so crucial to make sure that you are being treated appropriately and, and with your wellness and your mental wellness as a priority. And the way to do that is to get a wellness program going that can help um, assess not only your physical health, but your mental health. I know that there's, there are programs out there where, um, where there's uh, apps you can use for your physical health and then have a program in place for your mental health as well. So it's gonna reduce the overall cost to the employer because you're gonna keep your employees. You're going to be able to have them um, more dedicated. They're gonna be more um, willing to do what needs to be done. There's gonna be more resiliency. So you're gonna get more bang for your buck out of the, each employee. It's gonna decrease the turnover of your employees when you feel like they can, um, when they feel like they can be supported at your place of employment and not just pushed aside or told to get over it if they're feeling stressed or told that, you know, get written up because their quality of work goes down. Recognizing how important wellness is is going to help them to be able to, um, the, the, the employee to understand that you as the employer take their health seriously and it's going to help you to keep that turnover down. And injuries as well, and this happens not only in, um, in the field, if you're a field officer, it can happen um, at, on any level of whatever your job is. So if I'm feeling really stressed out, I can injure myself um, at home because I'm feeling distracted or stressed or whatever. If I'm out in the field, if I'm doing some kind of field work, I can injure myself on the job, which is gonna cost my employer money, which is going to be bad for me as the employee and as the employer. And really, we wanna improve employee morale and loyalty. So if, if I'm an employee and I feel like you have a good mental health program in place and that you're supporting me in every arena of my life, my job life, my mental health, my physical health, recognizing a good work-life balance. If I feel I'm supported, there's a greater likelihood that I'm going to be loyal to you as a company and that my, my morale is gonna be boosted. And in, as a consequence of that, I'm going to be able to be more efficient and more effective as your employee. So, you know, again, it's gonna lower the healthcare costs. If we're being more proactive, uh, healthcare costs are gonna be lower. But if you can um, imagine that we have people that are not taking care of their health and then waiting till something comes up and then they're, you know, by the time they get to the doctors, they have diabetes because they were being inactive and they were stressed out and they weren't um, watching what they were eating. Or if we've got somebody that goes in because their stress level is so high, their blood pressure is through the work, to the roof, and now they have to be on medication and they have to be monitored. And that's stressful for them and it's gonna increase your healthcare costs overall. And it's gonna, re so lowering that healthcare cost can be started by having a wellness program in place that recognizes that we all have things that we need to care for and that we as individuals need help around our own stress management. We need help around the incidents that we're seeing at work. We need help around how we can increase our resiliency at work and at home. It's gonna reduce absenteeism because if I'm feeling better, then I'm gonna be coming to work. If I'm feeling like I'm supported, I'm gonna let my supervisor know that I need the day off for a mental health day and they will support me in that. So I don't have to pretend to be sick. If I, you know, I can plan ahead and I can say, you know, I really need this Friday off for a mental health day and my, my, um, my company will support me. To achieve higher employee productivity, again, think about a time when you were really stressed 
over the last year because of COVID, we've all been very stressed. And everyone that I know has actually talked to me about feeling that their productivity has decreased because their stress level is up and they're not sure exactly how to decrease their stress. And as a consequence, their productivity goes down. So if we have people across the board that their productivity is going down, that's gonna increase their stress, which is gonna again, decrease their productivity. So it's this very vicious cycle. So if they knew that they had a place that they could go to that was supportive, they had um, opportunities to get resources, they had a community that they were working with that would help them in their wellness, that can help with their productivity, decrease their stress. And to reduce workers' comp and disability-related costs. So again, if you're feeling stressed out, you're not gonna be as aware of your surroundings necessarily. If you're feeling stressed out, you might not be as careful and cautious as you otherwise would. And that can increase the workers' comp and disability-related costs. You know, it's interesting. Um looking at uh, a lot of studies, and that's something that I do as a, as a commander is that uh, I'm always looking at research that's out there. And there's a lot out there about wellness, which is pretty cool that we're seeing more and more of that. I get a lot of law enforcement publications, uh, at least four a day, um, that talk about, uh, you know, they, of course, the, the stories and what's going on around the country, but it's, it's always nice to see that there's a paragraph in there about, um, wellness and how we need to take care of ourselves better, especially the way the things that have gone over the last year in 2020 was a tough year for law enforcement. So I was looking at the journal uh, clinical psychiatric report and it was talking about that 85% of employees that, that, that have mental health conditions are un undiagnosed or untreated, you know, and you think about that with your teams. Um, you know, many times our employees won't say anything, but we can see that sometimes. And if you know, if you know your team mates or your employees well enough, then you see that and it's like, well, something's going on in their, in their life right now, because there definitely has been a change. I mean, for example, you know, I had a, I had a rough week last week and um, Carol could pick that up. I mean, Carol, um, she's our MHP. Um, and but she knows me well enough where she knows my ups and downs, you know, if I had if I've had a rough week and that sometimes we miss that. And I thought that number was pretty being 85%. I mean, that's pretty high. So we're missing that. Okay, so it's something we need to look at. So, again, and then we look at the cost overall overall. I was looking at another study from the World Health Organization and they look at poor mental health costs in the trillions almost 1 trillion a year. I mean, that's a lot. And that's a loss of productivity that we're getting, we're, that we're missing there. And I, I know we, and that's one thing that, you know, I was thinking about that because we've been working from home. I'm, I'm virtual still, uh, while well, I'm virtual here, but I'm working remotely. Um, so I, I'm still at home. I mean, we're, we're working remotely and it takes a toll on us. Um, which is another reason I got to step in more and more and call my folks. I mean, yesterday I, I was calling folks every hour on each each person just to check in on them and see how they were doing. Um, and that projects out. So just to give you an idea, I have a couple of openings right now on the human trafficking side of my, my house. And um, I was talking to another judicial district and, and a, a person that was interested in coming over and um, they said, well, you guys have a really good reputation that you take care of your people. And that's important to say, hear that because I know some of my team members and actually one of my grumpier team members, actually the Carol Newsom I'm talking about, actually was at a, at a, at a scene, they were serving a search warrant. And he mentioned that, um, yeah, my, our commander really takes care of us. We have a great wellness program. He's very flexible with our schedule. So this person goes, hey, I'd be interested in filling that position because you guys have a reputation to take care of your people. And many times now in, in this day and age as law enforcement or, or if you're not law enforcement, but if you're working within the criminal justice field, money's not that important. We're in the, we're in the money's nice, don't get me wrong, but we're in, the, we're in this position to really help people, right? But we also wanna be happy in, where we're, where we're, what, in, the, in the job that we're doing. And part of the happiness is feeling secure in your workplace and making sure that people are there to support you. So having a good reputation in your agency to have that in place is important. 
So, um, and then again, it's the right thing to do. I mean, really think about it. I mean, it's, I mean, you care about your people and they're caring about other people and you want them to be able to go home just like the person that they took care of is able to go home. So it is the right thing to do. And then we definitely want to create a culture of care. As I mentioned earlier that, you know, you know, over the years, I mean, we, we haven't had that in place that, um, I mean, we do care about each other. I mean, of course, we go on warrants and things like that. And, and you always talk about how the difference between like and care. We're not gonna necessarily like everyone we work with, right? Different personalities, different things, that how we come across, but we care about everyone that we with, we work with. We care about their well-being, you know, and, and I'll be the first one, if needed, take a bullet for someone going in the door on a warrant, because I care about them, okay? And, but that care has to, uh, to expand into how we take care of our people in the workplace, not just putting it on the bulletproof vest and executing the warrants. It talks about mental wellness, right? The culture of care. And so as a leader, we need to focus on that. So we focus on developing their training so they don't stress out when they're at a scene and they're trying to, to do the job. So they have the proper skill, the training the skills that they need. And that's all part of what management can do to actually help them with that. So again, that is part of that culture of care. And then we wanna promote that open environment, that open dialogue where um, someone can come in and talk to me. I'll, I'll never forget on it. I've talked about this hundreds of times and you may have heard me say this before, but we had a pretty horrific case one, one day um, the guy went to prison, fortunately, uh, about a lot at the end of last year. Um, but we have found out that he was actually abusing um, family members and, and it was a long day. I mean, I, we interviewed a lot of folks, uh, you know, family members and children, and it's just uh, adults and children had, had, been, had been victims to this individual. It took a toll on the team. And then we went back to the office, checked all the evidence in, and we got another call that afternoon so it was a long day of dealing with that. And my team knows that I cult, we have a culture of care in our office where I care about how they feel and if they need time off and I'm flexible with everything that they do. So the next morning I came in and they're all standing together and one of my agents came up to me and he goes, can I talk to you boss? And I said, sure. And he, he closed my, my office door and he just broke down and that's okay. And, and that's okay, I know, and it sounds like, wow, is law enforcement doing that? Sure, that's okay to do that because he, he felt comfortable enough to come forward and ask for help and the open dialogue and said, you know, the rest of the team took it pretty hard and they need, they, they, they need to talk to Carol. And I was able to immediately contact Carol and to need your help now and she responded um, immediately, we have a uh, we have a I have a room on a different floor away from the office, away from everyone's work area, where um, they can go up there and be by themselves, meditate. Uh, it's a quiet room, whatever they want to make it, they can make that room. If they want to go and play games, that's fine, but it gives them a time to get away. Uh, Carolyn went up there and met with them, and that open environment, that dialogue, really helped because it helped them understand that they can say when I need help, it's time for help. So your folks need to feel comfortable enough that they can come forward and know that it's okay to ask for help and then have that comfortable accommodation if possible. Now it's not possible in every work environment, I know that, but think of other things that you can do and we'll talk about that going forward, but other things that you may be able to have for them. I was very fortunate that our attorney general actually said, yeah, I'll give, we'll create a, separate room just to use for quiet time or whatever you need for it, whatever you need to use it for. And the way it's decorated and everything, it's a great place to go. So again, think about how you can do that as management to make things easier for your folks. You know, um, and then having that, that team buy-in, okay? So when management shows support for an MHP program, and they're not concerned that it's not like a fit for duty thing or 
you know, they're, they're being, they're being watched or if they say something wrong or they ask for help, they're going to be labeled and pulled out of their position because our folks want to do what they're doing, right? They've trained, they've, they've asked to be in the position they they've gone through the training. They love, they love, uh, helping people. Um, they love saving that child, right? But they have to understand that management's going to support them in any way. We've told our folks, you don't have to talk to Carol. It doesn't have to be Carol, though Carol is part of our ICAC team. Um, everyone feels comfortable with her. If they want to go talk to a chaplain, they want to talk to the EAP, if they want to talk to someone outside the agency altogether, we'll pay for it. We'll figure out a way to take care of them. So we want to make sure that they understand that. And so that's a big part of it, having that transparent program and understanding that there is things that they can do to take care of themselves and management's going to support them. And then definitely um, explaining the benefits um, of, of wellness and why it's important. I tell my folks all the time. In fact, I had one of my, my analysts ask me yesterday, and I know she was really, it was really hard for her to ask for some reason, because she is my hardest working person, because she looks at every single tip and she puts together packets and does everything. And she goes, would it be okay if I have off next Wednesday? My went Thursday and Friday, my husband really, and I really want to go camping. And what would be the response to that? Of course, if I have to do the job, I will do it. It's okay. I've done it. Um, but I always have a backup plan, of course. And, but you always want to say yes. And of course, and that's part of the benefits of having a transparent program and having your folks buy into that, because they know that basically you're going to support them no matter what. So they feel safe, you know, they, they feel that the team's going to support them. Without a doubt, if that employee asks the rest of the team, do you guys mind if I take off next week and one of you is going to have to cover my, cover the cyber tips as they come in? They're going to say, of course, you, we'll support you whatever you need. And that's exactly what I heard today when I called and said, I need somebody to cover. Well, well uh, my, our analyst takes off some time to spend some time with her husband camping. It was said, hey, whatever we need to do, because she, she needs that time for herself as well. That's the kind of buy-in we want to see. Well, um, I'm sorry. Are you, do you want me to start, Carol? Go ahead, Anthony. You can go to the, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Okay. No, I, I did go to the next slide. Man, is she being team man, buy-in? Oh. Or, I'm um, not seeing that. I'm I'm not seeing the next slide. I'm sorry, Anthony. I'm just seeing oh, the previous okay. slide. Oh, here I'll I'll flip it one more time and then I'll go back to it again. Let's see. How do you see it? I see the management show. Yes. Management showing I support for MHP. Be... Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes and that's oh. your slide. I don't know. There it is. It's not. It's sticking. For there it goes. There oh, okay. we go. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was getting okay. stuff. Or... Yeah, I'm not sure why I got stuck like that. I think it's the arrow just went right below the little uh, magnifying I think, glass. I think what was happening is you just wanted to continue to talk, Anthony, and not have me talk. So I'm, I'm yeah, bursting in your way. So um, <laughs> achieving team buy-in, this is something that Anthony and I actually talked a lot about before I started working with the, um, with, his, with the task force because we knew that the previous mental health providers they had um, although they were great people, they weren't really a good fit for the team. So what did we need to do to get buy-in for the team so that we could, I could begin to do my work? And one of the first things I did was figure out um, a conversation that I could have with Anthony about how do we move past the stigma. And this is the stigma of reaching out. This is the stigma of saying that I'm not doing well. This is um, the stigma of, of um, saying, you know, I'm doing, I need some time off. I need to get some support. I am impacted by this work. So one of the first things that we did was to, um, one of the first things that we did was to uh, set aside time so that I could speak with each person individually. And, and I tried that out and people were, were kind of getting used to me. I mean, I'd actually done an interview with the whole group before they brought, I was brought on. So that they could have a say in who um, was going to be their mental health provider. 
and they agreed, but I think it was kind of like, yes, we're agreeing that she'll be great, but then, oh, we actually have to meet with her. Um, so there was that, you know, there was that, that um, the reality versus the theoretical. And so I met with people individually, and one of the things that I was very clear with in the beginning is you don't have, we're not going to sit down and I'm not going to say, how was your childhood? I'm not going to say, tell me about every kind of awful thing that's ever happened to you. What I did say is you can come here and talk to me about anything. You can talk to me about baseball. You can talk to me about your kids hockey. You can talk to me about issues you're having at work. You can talk to me about issues you're having at home, whatever you want to talk to me. We can talk about movies. I just wanted to spend some time building that rapport. Because, of course, who's going to go in? I mean, it does, even if you're not law enforcement, who's going to go in and automatically trust somebody enough that they're going to open up to their deepest, darkest secrets or talk about how much the work is impacting them? So I didn't want to push that. I wanted to give them the time to um, get to know me, to trust me, or if they felt like they couldn't trust me, use one of the alternatives that Anthony talked about. So we could move past the stigma of reaching out for help. And when we were able to do that, um, people were more willing to call me or text me or email me to see if they could meet with me. And, and another thing that we realized by um, coincidence was that when I initially meet with people, if I meet with them as a group instead of as an individual, there's more likelihood that um, we're going to be able to get somewhere. So if I go into... I I cover the whole entire state as part of our contract. And so if I go into um, one of our affiliates office and I don't know them very well, or I've only talked to them a couple times, I will say, let's all get together first. So we all sit down together. They can ask me questions. I can ask how things are doing overall. I can ask what kind of things they do for stress management. So it breaks that ice. And they're also with their peers for that sense of security. So it's more like if there's going to be a situation is more like them against me, which really realistically it doesn't feel like that, but at least they've got their workmates as their support system right there. And they get to see what it's like to talk with me and they get to see um, how things work. So, so we I met in a small group, people were able to support each other, which was useful because then when I wasn't there later on, they still had each other to, to support. Um, and have that built in support and they were able to open up in a way. So somebody said, you know, when I do look at these particular images, it's really difficult for me. And sometimes I go home and I take it out of my family and somebody else said, you do that too. I thought it was just me. And so then we start to have the conversation of, so how do you talk to your family about the work you do? And what are the consequences of not talking to your family? And that whole dialogue came about. And, and we were able to work through that and they were able to work through that um, together as a team. And so they had that built that strength together as a team. They knew I was there to kind of direct if they needed that. And then they felt comfortable coming back to me later. Um, often session, offer sessions regularly and visibly. Certainly. Anthony will put out an email. We haven't done it much since um, COVID started because I've been trying to meet with people virtually since we can't go into the office. But Anthony would typically, at least once a quarter, send out an email and say, Carol's going to be here on Friday. Here are the time slots. Please sign up. And again, when people sign up to talk to me, Anthony has no idea who's talking to me or what we're talking about because it's so important to keep that confidentiality. But it's, it couldn't get any easier for people when I show up at your office. You don't have to leave. You don't have to... Um, you know, go find parking. You don't have to drive anywhere. You just walk up or you just ride the elevator up um, a couple of flights of uh, stairs and then suddenly, you know, you're visiting with me. And so it makes it easier for everyone to feel comfortable. Um, so, uh, like we, I said, so we've got moving past the stigma, offering sessions, having small group activities, and then remember that mental health is an intensely personal topic. So it's not something that typically people are going to want to open up about um, right away, and they're not going to open up about their most concerning things for uh, any period of time, you know, for a long period of time, and they have to feel comfortable with the mental health provider. So, again, I don't push. If they just want to come in when I do quarterly check-ins and they want to say, have you seen how the football teams are doing, or, you know, my kid is, is playing soccer now and this is how it's going, that's what we talk about. 
Because again, then at some point when they feel like they need me, they can, I will be available to them. And then I have had many, many, many cases of people coming back later and say, you know, I'm trying to work on some communication with my wife. Can you tell me how to do that? Or somebody else will say, um, I, you know, I'm working on this case and it's really impacting me. And can you help me figure out how to um, set up my work environment so it's not so negative for me? And we do that as well. So having the opportunity really to um, meet with individuals is going to help enormously to get that team buy-in. Hey, Carol. So we think about the team buy-in. Um, the details of the program and is are important because your your folks are going to wonder again, what is this? What is this all about? Mental health, really? I mean, I, personally, I didn't think I'd ever even think about this uh, uh, 14, 15 years ago. I, I remember when I was when I used to work at, when I was in violent crimes. After we'd have a violent crime, we'd have a homicide, we'd debrief, and then there would be a psychiatrist. Um, usually, it was we had a department psych psychiatrist that was there, that, and that person actually did interview the cadets and then did the fit for duty and did everything right. And they were there at um, after the debrief, and then they would, um, you would have the opportunity to go walk with them and talk about uh, what you're experiencing and if how you dealt with that homicide and that. So, but quite honestly, how open were we, were we at that time? I mean, I know I wasn't, right? So I think it's important with a team buy-in because keep in mind that many of us may came, came from that environment. I mean, we may have been in a unit or we're still in a department where that's who we have available to us is the department uh, psychologist. That's uh, that's available, or the department psychiatrist, or or whoever they may be that that sits there and they interview the cadets or the applicants, and they're with the they're at the academy with the cadets, and then they're there to help you, and then sit there to a violent crime, and maybe there to support, but they they have other roles as well. So sometimes it's hard to get that buy-in. So in my case, um, I had I'd already thought about the details early on. Um, when I started helping with the shift program and started working um, with the shift program and other commanders around the country as we started developing the program, and I thought, well, this is the way I want it to look within my department, and I want to be very transparent. And that's what I tell my people all the time. I'm transparent, and sometimes I'm too transparent because sometimes I say too much, you know, and I'm like, but it's not when I say I, I'm very transparent about everything. Um, so, providing details about the program, what that should look like is important. So, I told my people, I'm very flexible with your schedule. In fact, when I do, when we do interviews, I, we, I've had other agents in the interview and they've sat there and said, yeah, um, our, our commander is very flexible. You pick your hours that you're going to work. So, the, throughout the day, you know, 8 to 5 or 7.30 to 4.30. But other than that, whatever happens in between those late hours, I'm very flexible with that. And that's part of the wellness program, and that's part of that team buy-in. Um, and then I always say, you know, acknowledge that there's going to be an impact on the family, right? So I, I always tell my folks, you know, when we're they're going through the interview process and, and before they get hired on with ICAC, I told them, I go, you realize this will take a toll on you. You know that. And they go, well, I've been a cop for a while. I, I'll be fine. You know, I've, I've been a homicide or I've worked robbery or I've, I've worked with with victims my entire career, so I'll be fine. I'm like, no, it's going to be a little bit different working in ICAC. It's and personally, I it is it is a different. It's I've seen things over the last 12 years that I didn't see my first 20 when I was at APD. So, um, but it impacts our family, and I have plenty of examples of that. But I want to let them know it's going to impact your family. So part of that program is bringing fam the family in. So Carol and I developed a program, and really Carol is instrumental in this because she's the one that actually works with the families. My job is more like the tour guide, you know, like on a, on a cruise ship or something, pointing which direction to go and stuff. So we'll bring the family in. And when I say family, it's significant other, spouse, um, usually not children, um, but however, if, they, if a child did show up, I mean, we're not gonna turn them away. But there's other things that we have in place too, that if we were to have children as well, we bring them in and show them the work environment of, 
of their significant other, what they're experiencing. This is their desk. On that display, they may look at child sexual abuse material. They may have to look at several hours of that, not the last two hours of the day, but several hours throughout the day. They may have to go in this interview room we have set up where they may have to interview a, a victim. They may have to interview someone in this room or a suspect. They may have to hear some difficult things. And that's all part of their job. And by drawing that picture for the family, they understand that. So when their significant other comes home and they say, gosh, I've had a rough day, you know, I had to look at images. They say, oh, I know what that means, looking at images. So explaining that, and that, that's part of the support program, part, part of the program is providing that kind of support. And then understanding that the program won't be, it's not fit for duty, right? It's not fit for duty. I can't tell you how many times I had to tell my federal partners that, and I had, I had to tell their upper chain of command, this is not about fit for duty. This is about them being successful in their job and taking that success home and being successful in their personal life as well. So again, it's not fit for duty. So choosing the right MHP can be difficult, can be very difficult, honestly. I mean, I, I made, and I hate to say mistakes because they weren't mistakes. They're amazing people that I brought on board, but finding the right MHP was, was a tour. I mean, um, and having, looking for the right person in your community. And I, I'll briefly share with you what I learned. Um, my first MHP was actually, um, the person I was looking at was with the Department of Public Safety. So kind of over working with law enforcement in general, mainly with our state police officers, but I heard some amazing things about her. But again, she was in that role where she was interviewing the applicant, helping with the applicants, going through that process, and then working with individuals once they were on, and then in many times doing that fit for duty thing, right? So that was difficult. So wasn't a person that was gonna work out for our team. And then um, the other person was somebody that I had over, that I worked with at the university, same place Carol and I met, and he was part of my program that I was overseeing. And he was also, he's also a doctor, and psychiatry and, and uh, I believe that's his field. But anyway, he's, and he's a CIT guy. And anyway, he was one of the guys, right? When I was at APD. And again, wasn't someone that everybody rushed out to call. So finding the right person from, in my case was, I got a chance to meet Carol because we were both area chairs in our programs. And we had to share sometimes our, all our people together in her program and my program at criminal justice and she had social work and counseling. And we brought all our folks together sometimes and we would team work with them. And I saw her in her action and I go, wow. So Carol didn't come from the background of law enforcement initially. She didn't have that background. But my folks had, a, it was immediate buy-in for them because when they met her, they said, wow, this person is great because she wasn't some, a new, he wasn't a face that they'd seen before, okay? So looking at that, and then of course, um, some other, other law enforcement agencies might have someone that they work with. Again, I gave you an example with my state police contact, um, wasn't the best move for me, but again, I learned from that. And then doing the MHP team interview, really, um, as I mentioned, was a big sell for me because I told my team, just sit down with her and talk to her. And you know what? You don't have to be, you don't have to give your deep, darkest secrets like Carol mentioned. If you want to talk about sports, she knows about sports. You want to talk about food? She knows a little bit about food. But, you know, because she doesn't eat a lot and she's, sometimes she doesn't like saying things I like. But anyway, but I said you could talk to her about anything, right? So that team interview really, really helped. And that got, broke the ice and they were able to talk to her. So again, think about things and how you can implement and have your team be part, part of the process. Well, and I think, I just want to say there, Anthony, I think that for me, it was nice to be having a team interview because it gave me a chance to kind of um, get to meet people and 
present who, who I am, where I came from, why I wanted to do this work. It gave me an opportunity to open up to them before asking them to open up to me. And, and it also gave them the, to empower, empower them to say, you know, she's not a good fit or she is a good fit. So then going in right away, we would already know that at least, you know, some of the people, the majority of the people on that team were interested in working with me or at least trying to work with me. So I think the team interview idea was a really, um, really good idea on Anthony's part. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. Thank you. And it was a great idea on my part. Thanks, Tristina. <laughs> so choosing the MHP, um, uh, again, looking for a provider that experienced with vicarious trauma and uh, knowing uh, Carol's background, working with marriage and family and, you know, definitely dealing with some of the trauma there, as we all know, working in law enforcement, that domestic can be very difficult to work in. So. She was definitely a good fit there. Um, but finding the right person um, that has some background in that, I mean, you can't, you know, I thought about that initially, just pulling someone fresh out of, out of the university that just got their degree. But honestly, you don't need that MHP when you, that comes in and says, wow, I don't understand how you can deal with all this. Because I've heard that before from an MHP and other professionals, of course, so having someone that knows how to work with individuals that are, that are experiencing vicarious trauma, compassion, fatigue, all that stress that we deal with in law enforcement, right? Um, and then looking for that person with a specialized training. And I, I'm, I'm, I want Carol to talk a little bit more about these areas because I was looking for that because I already knew what I wanted to see from my experience and some of the mistakes I already made. And then, of course, what I was feeling, but I knew it was important to have someone that would be able to give the right tools. I, I didn't want someone that's going to sit there and look at my person and say, okay, how do you feel about that? And really not ask those questions and give those tools that they may need. Because it's great to have someone sit there and listen to you talk, but sometimes law enforcement doesn't want to talk, right? So you need someone to be able to give that kind of tool. And I knew my, our Carol would be that person. She was able to step in the meeting and say, well, have you thought about trying this? Or she was able to get that out of them, which I thought was really cool, is they went from talking about baseball to talking about how the job was uh, affecting them there and at home as well. And that's where that trust came in. And Anthony, I'll be happy to talk about the specialized training. So not everyone has to have the training, obviously, that I have, but I've done a lot of training on trauma um, and on trauma-informed care and on vicarious trauma because I wanted to make sure that I could support our staff. I also did a lot of training on working with law enforcement because just like working with any specific group is going to be different from working with another specialized group, it's important to know what you um, should be expecting. So I, there was um, uh, one of our folks that I was working with that needed longer term therapy. And for our contract, I can do a short amount of therapy, but I can't do anything long term. So after having the number of sessions they could have with me, I helped to refer them to <clears throat> Um, a longer term therapist. And what I learned right away is that therapist did not have any um, experience working with law enforcement. And what had happened is I had referred that person to one therapist, that therapist was full, that therapist referred the individual to a second therapist. And that therapist had no experience working with law enforcement, particularly with ICAC. And so what happened is the ICAC employee went to that therapist and uh, to talk about the vicarious trauma, and the therapist said, the only way you're going to not be traumatized is if you quit your job. Well, who wants to hear that? You know, so then it's like invalidating all of the um, work that they're currently doing and the pride they take in what they're doing and the joy. And so it wasn't that that was a horrible, horrible experience for that person because it's like, you know, not only are they not going to get support around their trauma unless they quit their job, but now they're feeling like, I'm stuck. I'm stuck being miserable unless I quit. So it's very important to when you're find, looking for an MHP to make sure they have a very good understanding and a handle on trauma and then at least an understanding, if not specialized training, working with law enforcement or other types 
of um, individuals that your that you your agency works with. And just so everyone knows, since then, uh, Carol's name is known among all law enforcement now because everyone uses her. So she works with the homeless population on a street safe program with law enforcement. And my agency has actually picked her up for some other things. And she's our our person that if we there's an officer involved shooting, she's going to respond. So um, the, everyone trusts her. So it's kind of cool that, it, that it's all come about that way. Um, so one of the things to think about, though, is it can be difficult, really. I mean, I, I gave you some great examples of how it can be difficult to find the right um, mental health provider, um, but it's not impossible. It really, it, it isn't. Um, sometimes just the, the word of mouth, the referral that way is may be the best way to go, you know. It may be, you know, once you get your team together, you ask them, so has any of you, do any of you know of a mental health provider that could help us um, that knows how to deal with uh, with these, some of the issues that we deal with on a daily basis. And then um, looking for that training experience um, that's appropriate for your agency, right? Um, and that, that may look different. That may look different. Again, I know this is geared towards ICAC, but, you know, I also have human trafficking. And that picture looks a little bit different. However, um, your mental health provider should be able to do that, right? Um, it, you may be looking for a mental health provider to work with your your forensic examiners or your forensic interviewers or uh, the folks that uh, your victim advocates that go out, okay? Does that person look a little bit different? Now, um, as I mentioned, Carol wears many hats with our with our agency now. I mean, they... She's able to adapt to a lot of different things, but it all started with our ICAC team, right? And it started with that trust where it just branched out to other areas. So think about that. It can be difficult, but it's not impossible. Oh, go ahead, Anthony. We'll go to the next slide. Oh. Okay. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, you already went to the next slide. Okay. No, you got me scared. So, oh. <laughs> no, 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 you're, you're just really on it, Anthony, and I was looking at the previous slides thinking you've got to move on. So um, support can include a program coordinator. So because our program is fairly small, Anthony, I guess, would be considered the program coordinator. And for what that looks like for our program is Anthony calls me up and said, hey, Carol, can we schedule something? So um, it's not official kind of program coordination. Um, but um, that's what it looks like for us. So that would be the person that will be the go-between, more than likely between the task force and the mental health provider. And then you've got the mental health provider and then the coworkers and the family. So these are all people who can help to create this program to make the program um, work. So the mental health providers are there obviously to give the support and um, and be the, the lead in that. And then the coworkers can support through peer support, the coworkers can support through, um, let, you know, uh, saying, noticing that one of their peers is not doing so great and then going to the MHP and saying, hey, when are you coming to our office next? It looks like there's three or four of us that need to talk. Uh, the coworkers can also talk to each other and say, you know, do you think you might need to go see Carol because you're looking kind of sad or you're looking a little bit more angry. And then family involvement is really important because having that family involvement means that the family can feel like they're a piece of it and they can they can feel like they're helping their um, family member through the work by being there in, in a support role. And allowing the family to be in a support role is so amazingly important. Yeah, and you're, and you're right. So one, and Carol mentioned this at the very beginning, that coworkers, even when she was meeting with the team setting and when she got them to start talking, and they said, oh, you're experiencing that too? And they started going back and forth and started that dialogue. That's very helpful because when she's not around or when I'm not around, or they can depend on each other and say, hey, remember when we had that session with Carol? You know, uh, and you mentioned you're experiencing that. I'm experiencing that now, so they can start supporting each other, which is very helpful. So you're starting to develop that. So it's almost that uh, that peer support model, but a um, little more informal. But understanding how they can support each other a little bit better. 
So we want to look at the um, provider choices. So what do you have within your agency? Do you have an employee assistance program, which is um, a list of people that the therapist can, I mean, that the employee can choose from, or sometimes it's a whole group of, of therapists that um, get assigned to an individual. If that's your option, you want to make sure you're checking in to see if um, that employee assistance therapist has some knowledge around law enforcement and or vicarious trauma or whatever specifically the issue is with your team. Chaplaincy is always a great thing. Anthony did this for our team when, when people were having um, issues more related to how they were feeling around um, their religious beliefs and the work they were doing. So that worked really well. And then formal peer to peer support, if that's available, not all, um, not all agencies have that. If it's a formal peer to peer, definitely there's the opportunity for coworkers to support each other, but there's also a formal peer to peer support training that can happen if that's something the team may feel is necessary. And a great point, Carol, that, you know, the, uh, and one of, the, one of the important things to remember though, um, with all these programs, just make sure, especially within ICAC, that they understand what the investigators what your folks are really experiencing, what they're going through, what they're seeing, okay? Um, and one of the things that I did with the chaplaincy program is that I actually uh, uh, did a special training for the chaplains. And actually I had SHIF come out um, also, and, um, and I didn't actually present this one. It was another MHP and, um, and it was an, another commander that actually, another trainer that came out and they did a, they did a training for, and it just, I, we decided to do it this way, but they did a training for the chaplains on um, what ICAC is all about and how, what are the things they're experiencing and how they could better support. That way, when they do go out and meet with the teams, um, they weren't in shock when the, they told them, this is what I saw today on, on, on the screen. They wouldn't get that response like, oh my gosh, how can you deal with that? Or they were able to deal with it better and, and they were able to actually know how to respond better to that. So. Um, just keep that in mind when you're providing other choices that that other choice um, is ready to understand what ICAC really is. And then, so, of course, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go, ahead, go, ahead. Anthony, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say uh, assessing the program. So, of course, um, the immediate team needs. So what's going on within the team? Um, what are you seeing? If it's a fairly uh, young and new team, I mean, what are they experiencing? You know, uh, so, and then what are your, what are your affiliates and the teams experiencing? As I mentioned earlier, um, doing, we do a lot of warrants with our affiliates and it, it's important they understand that um, there's a good program in place that they understand that they can, they can rely on, on the program. So I'm, I'll be the first to actually go talk to a sheriff or a chief or, um, on the federal side, their ASAC or their RAC or whoever it may be, and to explain to them, you know, this is the program I have in place, not fit for duty. It's to make sure that your folks are successful in what they do, and and they can go home each night and and continue living a healthy and productive life. So that's all part of that is showing that type of support system. Anthony, did you go to the next? Okay, here we go. So what I do with our team is we have different types of support. And one of those is one-on-one -on -one sessions if people want that. That's initially I was getting a lot of what we would call team cohesion exercises or small group. And now we have those, but then in between that, there's people that will call me up and say, hey, can I meet you for a one-on-one? -on -one? So having that variety um, helps people to continue to feel safe and allows them to work on the issues that they might have initially brought up in a small group session. So we have one-on-ones where um, they will call me up or Anthony will schedule me to come in and they meet with me individually. We have the team cohesion exercises, meaning what can we do to build our team a little bit tighter. Anthony will, um, when he has the opportunity during pre-COVID days, he would have team exercises where they could go do something together to strengthen their team because we wanna make sure that the team members know each other in environments other than just the work environment. So if you were working with um, child exploitation materials or sexual assault materials and, um, and 
all you looked saw or looked, knew that that person was one through work and all the awful stuff that you're seeing, then every time you see them, you make that connection with that person reminds me of the awful stuff I have to see. But if you can do something else outside of work, then you can say, I know that person and they remind me of that awful stuff, but then they also remind me of the barbecue we had. They also remind me of the um, team activity we did. So those are really great as far as mental health. And then small group team sessions where people can really feel comfortable opening up and then that builds that rapport with me and with themselves. And then really understand the true nature and the scope of, of um, child uh, sexual assault material, which Anthony can quickly talk to, um, talk about. Um, yeah, dealing with the uh, criminal uh, child sexual abuse material, um, it's definitely understanding that the scope of it and how it's going to affect you every day. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I started thinking about something that I wanted to share with this, this small group. Um, one of the things, and, and it's all tied to this, of course, I, I noticed that my team had got together. We had talked about this. They got together for breakfast one morning and um, they didn't invite me. Um, and I realized a little later, I, I had, I realized I was thinking about it and I go, well, when they invite me that they feel they couldn't be open. Well, I wanted it, it was important for them to get together without inviting me because they got a chance to vent <laughs> and talk about some of the things that they're experiencing um, and how it's affecting them. And I before they wanted to talk to, to me about how it is. And one of the issues, of course, is they wanted to go back to the office because it's it's they, they're tired of working from home. And uh, we have to understand that, that, uh, and they're tired of working from home because of the child sexual abuse material, right? And, and how it's affecting them. And that was some of the things that they shared together in their small group session. They just met for breakfast one morning, which I'm perfectly fine. In fact, I told them again yesterday, I said, you guys need to get together for breakfast again and just talk and don't make it about work. Just talk about life, okay? And I want you to do that. Since we're not back in the office, you don't get a chance to do that in the office. So I gave that to them because I understand the scope of the material can definitely be difficult doing it at home. So that gave them that opportunity. And I recognize that as a leader, that I don't have to be there, that they now know they can depend on each other. And we have to be able to recognize that too. Resources that we can give. Um, I give out hotline numbers because you never know when somebody might be in crisis and need that. A list of social services that are available. So maybe if they're telling me that they need to work on um, some support for their kids, where can they get a therapy for their kids? I'll give a list for that. Self-help books, then depending on the topic. So if it's grief, I recommend one book. If it's communication with their spouse, if it's understanding their relationships, I'll give them books so that they can have ongoing support even when I'm not around. And then awareness and education campaigns. There's um, Mental Health Awareness Month, so maybe starting some sort of a challenge during Mental Health Awareness Month, or looking at education campaigns, or creating something on your own as a team that you're going to do a, a, a challenge or something related to mental wellness that everybody in the team can get involved with and, and get buy-in. And then the other types of support. So health promotion, what do we mean by that? We want to promote wellness and health. And so by doing that, we're going to be um, encouraging people to make sure that they're taking steps to make their lives um, better. We're gonna encourage them to do the things for their wellness. Education and training, some of the, the training that I do with our families and our teams related, is related to educating them, educating them on brain science, educating them on um, what they what they're experiencing, what their spouses are experiencing, so that will give the family members that support that they need. Incentive programs again, you can do this as kind of a challenge. So maybe the team can get together and talk about um, an incentive program, like drinking you know x amount of water or x amount of steps they can take, or um, what kind of stress management things that they can do. All of those are incentive programs, and oftentimes when we're doing it together as a group, it's more likely we're going to follow through. And then making sure that your agency or your group has mental health policies in place to support what you're doing. And then access um, health risk assessments if possible to just make sure that, that when people need support, 
you can help them assess where they need that support, or at least direct them to where they can get that support. And, you know, conducting surveys, this doesn't have to be something that's really complicated. You could do a survey monkey. You could do something where there's a printout and you just put an X on the boxes. Um, it's, it's useful to have this information because this is a way for people to anonymously talk about what's working and what's not. You could discuss the survey with the ICAC team, whether that means in person and just say, how did you feel about the, um, the type of support you're getting? What did you think about the survey? Are we missing something with our mental health program that we need to add? And then having some stress management sessions for everybody where it's not directly related to maybe the ICAC work, but maybe it's related to how do we manage stress in all areas of our life? And what are the best things that you can do? And again, having that as a group is gonna help support everyone and they're gonna learn some new skills from each other. Definitely. And workforce mediation or meditation programs. This is something that at our office we do. Um, and it's a wonderful thing. We start off our morning by, by doing, um, we were doing some yoga together when we were all together, but now we can't do that. So when we first do our check-in over Zoom, we'll do a meditation. And it's not a long one, it's five or 10 minutes. So we're not doing something that um, is gonna be too time consuming. And um, it's gonna be something that's gonna start our day off and it sets the tone for the day. Breathing exercises, if anybody's around me for longer than a day, they're not going to know that I highly recommend breathing um, exercises that you can do. Belly breathing is my, is my one go-to for everything. If there's nothing else you can do, make sure belly breathing is part of your toolkit uh, because it's so useful. And then, you know, having a mental health day. So what does that look like? Does that mean that, that you all in your office celebrate mental health together or does mental health day mean taking off a mental health day say i recognize that i've been really stressed and i need to take care of myself at this time and then uh, definitely being comfortable what work uh, as i mentioned earlier we have a a, a private area uh, a room on this on uh, on a different floor all together that it's it's a good size room has a couch some chairs um, the way it's painted it's definitely a really nice room so making that part of a good environment for them to, to escape from or escape to um, and actually go up there. Uh, in fact, uh, it's funny, I, had one, I walked in there, we have an ICAC suite, which is where our ICAC investigators are at and everyone was off one day except for one agent. And I walked in there just to check on everyone or to check on him and the lights are off. And um, I'm like, what's going on? And uh, and the light, the sensor went on and he was laying there on the floor and he was uh, just relaxing, meditating, you know? Um, and and I, I was excited that he felt that comfortable to do that in that room and that's okay. And in fact, their ICAC suite, I actually have a big screen TV. Um, we have Netflix on there. Um, they can have that on uh, throughout the day and it's a comfortable work environment. So they know that it's like that. So, but. The way I want them to connect to the outside world, because unfortunately this suite doesn't have any windows the way the office is set up, um, they're required to get up and go for a walk at least once an hour. Um, and they can do that more, of course. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a micromanager, I don't restrict them. But having that kind of flexibility, knowing that they feel comfortable enough to lay on the floor in the room, and not worried that you know they're going to get in trouble for that. And able to watch something and have something in the background on the TV, um, you know, while they're doing some of the work is fine. Again, having that supportive environment, it's what it might look like in your office. I have done things that I never thought I'd be doing, for, you know, 15 years ago. Um, but we have to change the way we think on how we're going to support our people. And then, of course, um, onboarding, uh, developing an interview process, you know, on what you're going to do and uh, how you're going to, how you're going to onboard new individuals. It's, you know, we actually, I talked about this morning, I actually talked about this process this morning in one of our, one of our supervisor meetings, um, allowing um, a candidate to shadow an investigator because not everyone understands what ICAC really is. You know, everybody wants to come in and go, wow, wow, we can raise good children. This is exciting. Not understanding that you're gonna be exposed to images, probably the most horrific thing that you'll see 
in your career in, in the criminal justice field and not understanding what that's all about. So maybe think about that. If someone's really, you have a candidate that's really truly interested in coming in to work for you, maybe have them shadow an investigator. If they're not an affiliate already and they don't really understand what ICAC's all about, have them spend a day with an investigator so they can see what they do. Um, you wanna encourage candidates to speak with other investigators, right? Ask those questions. I had someone put in for uh, talking about the positions I have open. She called me. Um, she asked another, uh, one, another one of my agents over the weekend. And then she called another agent on Tuesday. That's what I want to see. I want her to feel for the position. That way there's no surprises, right? So again, just getting that onboarding is important. We actually, part of our interview process, I have the standard HR questions. And then there's six specific questions to the job. Two of those questions have to do with how do you handle vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue? And I have them explain that to me, then I explain to them why it's important and I wanna hear their response. And then another one of those questions is it, it, what I have them do is if they never, I, I have them read um, a description of um, some chat between a, a, a predator and, and, a, and a child and again, it's not describing content, it's just a chat, but you know how bad those can get. And say, what do you think about that? Because you're reading chats. Now, you're gonna be seeing things a lot worse than that, of course, so how do you feel about that? So again, the onboarding process is important to understand what they're coming into. Oops. Um, I'm sorry, this, I am having problems with this arrow again. Um, okay, here we go again, there we go. Awesome. Again, um, exploring the transition process and what kind of, what does that look like? Um, offering training for the employee. Okay, so uh, part of that training is, again, part of the mental health and wellness is having good training in place to make, understand their job and being comfortable with it. And so they understand when they're coming on board is that you're not gonna be out there by yourself and try to figure it out. You're gonna get training to get the job done, to understand how to do the job and, and get the job done. And then you're also gonna have a mental health support that you need to get the job done. You're not gonna be out there by yourself on an island. And then in our case, you know, with Carol, I, uh, ideally, you know, we, we've done this, we've done this in a group setting now or virtual but Carol would actually be coming and meet with the individual at least within a month of them actually being on board so she can see how they're doing. So definitely an important part of the program. Of course, the agency flexibility is important um, and sometimes that might be difficult in, within some of your agencies and that's why um, having the chain of command really understand what we do and why it's important to take frequent breaks um, uh, the large cases and how they can expand out and how sometimes um, that person may need help with those cases. Um, viewing images an hour before uh, the shift ends. Um, my rule in my office is the last two hours a day, they can't look at child sexual abuse material, okay, period. Um, I just, I don't want them looking at the last two hours of the day. They can write reports that they'd like or, or take some online training or, or do something, but I don't want them looking at child sexual abuse material. Um, uh, encouraging switching to other projects, you know, throughout, uh, if they're stuck looking at images and they gotta get through a program, um, maybe one day doing that and then doing something different the next day. You know, think about how you can have them help in different areas and how you can break up that time. It may be one day they're looking at images, another day they're doing backgrounds or they're doing surveillance or they're looking at a target or just getting out of the office and doing some surveillance on a target they may be looking at, may break up that day for them. Or maybe helping in the lab with acquisitions or something, learning something new, okay? Or even helping your analysts or helping in a different area. Um, I always recommend that. My folks now during the pandemic, they're required to take training every, every week. And I don't care what kind of training it is. If they want to learn about virtual currency or Bitcoin or whatever, you know, and it may not apply sometimes to the ICAC cases, I want them to do something a little bit different to continue 
and to build um, build themselves up. And of course, having that open door policy is important. You know, and as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, is your folks should be able to feel comfortable to come in and say, "Look, we need help. We, we can you help us at this time? This is what how this is affecting us." Okay. Um, Again, um, having that agency support is important. Viewing the child sexual abuse materials should be treated serious. Um, and then uh, having the unnecessary interruptions, um, trivialization or unnecessary interruptions is important um, because it is a serious time. I, I mentioned in our, in our office, we actually have a suite where the ICAC investigators are behind closed doors. So um, other investigators are not going to be exposed to the child sexual abuse material, um, but that can be difficult for them too because it is it is they it has them isolated. So again, it's important as as an as management to make sure that they leave that area and 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 they go maybe talk to other investigators or go for a walk. Um, respect the job, of course, and one of the biggest things that really gets under my skin, of course, is kitty porn. Um, we're moving away from child pornography because um, it's adult pornography and child pornography. We have found that many, uh, even with the judicial system, with judges, they've said it's just a picture case, it's just pornography, it's not just pornography. So we call it child sexual abuse material, and it's the movement throughout our country that that's what we're doing, right? That's, that's how we refer to it. Okay. And that's all right. All that's <laughs> Thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you guys so much. This was an absolutely amazing presentation, and I know we are very close to time. So in order to make uh, William and Entak happy, I will actually hand it over to him, um, and I have a record of uh, the questions that were asked. Um, I will leave my email in the chat. So if your question did not get answered today, Please um, send me an email and I will get it to you. Again, I have the question, but I'm not entirely sure uh, who it came from. And we will have this session recorded, as we said, uh, and available on our website. Also, the resources and tools that I mentioned on the website, if you go to uh, shiftwellness.org and you select any of the categories below, whether you're an, um, a mental health provider, you're a family member, someone mentioned they're a student, you just have to select your category and it'll actually let you download uh, those handouts. So again, thank you so much to Carol and Anthony. Um, my email will be in the chat for all of you and William, take it away. All right. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Gabby, and thank you to Carol and Anthony for, yes, again, another great presentation. Um, again, as Gabby mentioned, she will indeed uh, have her information as well as how you can get in contact with SHIFT uh, to address those questions. Uh, before we wrap up, um, while we wrap up, I'm actually going to go ahead and put up another quick poll question for our audience, uh, uh, and I'll have it up while I'm closing out today's slides. Uh, on the poll whole question, basically, uh, all we want to know is how do you plan to uh, apply the uh, information that you <clears throat> learned from today's web, web event? So uh, I'll go ahead and open up that poll, and folks can go ahead and feel free to identify as many options as they would like there um, while I close this out here. Uh, so the uh, just reminder that I first want to begin with is to show you all where you can contact uh, INTAC as well. Um, and you can contact us at this link as well as sign up for our listserv. You can also find us on Facebook at OJJDP TTA. Just a reminder that you will receive your certificate in 24 hours via an automated email from OJDP's INTAC. Please keep an eye out in your email for your certificate. Just as a, uh, <clears throat> another reminder, you can get in contact with the TTA Help Desk at the number and email address listed here. You can also uh, learn more about OJJDP at their website here, ojjdp.ojp.gov. You can sign up for their listserv as well, their Juve Just listserv to learn more about upcoming events. You can also view upcoming events on their website as well. 
Do you have a training or technical assistance need? Well, if so, please submit a request for help via the OJJDP TTA 360 platform. You can access that platform through the URL located here. A reminder that the webinars are indeed archived on our YouTube channel. I also included in the chat a few other locations where you can view uh, today's web event, including past web events as well. If you would like to reach uh, or receive any supporting materials, please contact OJJDP TTA Help Desk at this email address listed here on this slide. And uh, finally, uh, a few reminder of upcoming events that we have. Uh, please note that we do have part four and part five of this uh, shift wellness series that is available now for folks to register. Uh, if you haven't already, please register for those events. And part six, the final uh, uh, part in the series is coming up May 12th. Um, so please, if you have not registered for those events, uh, please feel free to do so. Other than that, thank you all very much for a uh, wonderful afternoon. Thank you again to our presenters and our moderator. Everyone have a wonderful afternoon and thank you so much for your time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.